that spot. Okay, so the next, um, next thing that's discussed here is generation costs and the prospect for cheaper nuclear power. Um, so you, you look at this, the, the fuel itself is pretty cheap. It's only 11%. Uh, paying your operators to run the show and maintain it only 20%. Decommissioning it, so taking it apart at the end is only 1%. It's the, uh, it's the capital charges. It's the, it's the actual cost of money up front that's your big, um, big money hog. And I know in the 102 book, there's actually a neat little table on the time value of money. I don't see it here in uh, one. Are you guys familiar with the concept of time value of money at all? Let me let me just show you. Let me just show you something briefly. We did this in um, we did this in 102. I just want to let you know it's. It's just, it's just a fancy name for interest rates. So most people would rather have a dollar now or than later because of inflation. A dollar is, is worth less down the road. So anyway, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just skip it for now. I, we, we kind of need to get through the rest of the chapter. But um, it's just showing you. So if, if the investors up front say, hey, here's um, half a billion dollars to build your, your plant, I'm going to need, you know, over the, over the lifespan of the plant, 40 years, I'm going to need four times that amount of money back. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to need that back. You know, because you, I gave you my money, and I could have been doing something else with it instead. But now you have it, and it's up to you to. So that's where that um, big cost comes from. Is just paying back the capital, paying back the initial investment. And I, and I, I think to a large extent, that might be why we get a lot of pushback from renewables. You know, not that. You know, you can you can look at the cost of a new solar installation. It's it's competitive now with the cost of a coal-fired power plant. But what you frequently don't consider is the fact that whoever paid for that coal-fired power plant is still waiting to get his or her money back out of it. So, okay. oh, before we get into this, though. Let's just go back one slide. I'm going to, I'm going to take a peek at table 11.3. And here are estimated costs of electricity. So nuclear, we're looking at uh, about 10 cents or, or 10 pence per kilowatt hour. For nuclear, we're looking at 16 pence for offshore, 9 for onshore, 6 for gas, and then 6 for coal. So Nuclear is um, more expensive than gas and coal, but less than onshore or offshore wind. Now, if carbon becomes priced, you know, so a, a dollar fifty-one per kilowatt hour or four dollars per kilowatt hour um, without carbon sequestration, then um, nuclear becomes more competitive. Then table 1114 is looking at comparison of, of U.S. electricity costs, and they don't um, they don't put wind in there, but the nuclear uh, does end up being more expensive than uh, both the pulverized coal or the combined cycle gas turbine. Okay, now a few things to try to reduce nuclear cost. Modular construction, simplifying design, simplifying the fuel handling, increasing the temperatures to make higher efficiency. We talked about that before. So a generation three <clears throat> evolutionary development of the pressurized water designs tackles the safety and attempts to reduce construction costs. So he's got a, a steel secondary containment vessel, a passive gravity fed. So in that case, if the thing, if the core goes down, you don't have to pump water in there. It's just, it's just you know, some uh, switch flicks and in comes the water, you know, passively, just gravity fed. Um, fewer pumps, fewer controls. I talked about complexity earlier. Just you know, make the thing simpler, a little more fail safe. 
simplified safety system, fewer safety-related pumps, uh, the whole thing is smaller, and then uh, modular. So last time we talked a little bit about these generation four reactors, and so here's your, your fuel handling strategy. So rather than having, it's almost like the, it's like the pellet stove. You know, you, you, we've gone from the log fireplace to the pellet stove. I think the same thing is, is apparently happening in the nuclear plant as well. So the, the shell is more or less a, um, uh, a buffer to maintain the or an absorber to main, maintain the reaction rate at, a, at an appropriate level. Once they get close together, then they hit critical mass, and then the chain reaction occurs. 900 degrees Celsius. Um, this is wild. Pumping high pressure helium gas through the pebbles. Helium has, has become a big issue. There's, there's um, only a finite amount of helium in the atmosphere, and to um, uh, to get it out of the atmosphere, you basically just have to make the air really cold. You know, you make it you make it so cold that the you know the nitrogen uh, condenses, the oxygen condenses. You keep going. <clears throat> Ultimately, the helium condenses, and then you, you just kind of pull it off the. I think in this case it'd be the, the, the top of the stack. It's going to be one of the lighter gases. So um, more or less putting energy in because to, to cool something you have to run it through um, compressors and all that. So you know putting all that energy in so you can get the um, helium out. But still, at the end of the day, there's a um, steam turbine, 40 percent efficiency. Okay, Carnot efficiency is mentioned. Um, it's also discussed that to get typically with high temperature comes high pressure and tougher on the steel alloys. <coughs> All right, so that's kind of a next next gen nuclear technology. Chapter eleven nine uh, discusses reprocessing. So again, here we are back at Sellafield. The plutonium and uranium being different elements, they can be, they can actually be separated chemically rather than in a centrifuge and then reprocessed. So Purex, plutonium, uranium recovery by extraction, not easy, still radioactive. Another one, the thermal oxide reprocessing plant, MOX, so that's the metal oxide fabrication, and there's several others in uh, around the world as well. Okay, and then the, the nuclear industry is getting into recycling as well. So you've got um, a couple different streams coming in. One is your de depleted uranium. Uh, and then your naturals coming in at the bottom. The, uh, the fresh, we're looking at 16 tons per year that goes into the reactor. Uh, it can also withstand a little bit of this MOX. You know, it's not as high quality of fuel, but hey, better than nothing. It's a little bit like, I don't know, burning your cardboard or your paper along with your campfire and your wood stove, I guess. Just, you know, it's not a high quality, but still, still does the job. Mm. So then spent fuel can go to the Purex, like we just mentioned. Uh, there's, some, there's some solid waste. There's some liquid waste. Of the liquid, this can then go into uh, a glass storage or um, spent mocks. And yeah, so at this point, this stuff that was fresh is now spent and, and going into those storage containers like we mentioned previously. And who knows, maybe somewhere down the road somebody figures out a fantastic use for this stuff too. <laughs> um, there is a mention in here that, um, that nuclear fuel has been used in warheads. So one 
and I, I've, I've seen evidence of this before, is that, well, you've got all this yucky uranium sitting around, and what better place to use it than on the battlefield aimed at some enemy. Um, and unfortunately, I, I, I have heard of that happening. Um, and if we keep moving through here, it looks like plutonium being used in these fast breeder reactors. So it says the possibility of converting unwanted depleted uranium, I'm on page 455, kind of middle of the page, consisting of 99.7% uranium-238, so not really what you want, um, into a useful fuel. So in, the, in this fast, a flux of, of fast neutrons, so it's, they're actually talking about the speed at which those neutrons are coming out of the, the nucleus in these fission reactors. And do, do read through this carefully because there's a couple questions on the exam about the difference between fast breeders and other types of plants. Um, it does discuss the fact that the enrichment has to be greater. Okay. Now, it's not all just about uranium and plutonium. Here is uh, making your uranium from thorium, more or less. So um, thorium is just one proton shy of becoming uranium, but you can't, well, I guess you could, but in, inside a reactor, neutrons are in um, high supply. So if a neutron comes in uh, to this thorium nucleus, it is unstable, it undergoes a beta decay, so that electron comes off, and now what used to be a neutron is now an electron, which is, see you later, and a proton that's sitting there. So, um, from there the thorium uh, decays, Let's see what's going on. So one, one electron comes off, and then this guy, 230, okay. Um, yeah, thorium 90, so it's still thorium at this point. Let's go back to our dynamic periodic table. Love the dynamic theory table. Ooh, how did Amazon? And they're sneaky. They just sneak right in there. I do not want a Yahoo search. Because Yahoo cannot read my mind the same way that the Google can. You guys been seeing this too, like super slow network today? Yeah, I had troubles in my computer class. Okay, so there's 91, it's protactinium. That's what we're looking at. And then finally, uh, once this other electron comes in, the uh, protactinium becomes, uh, becomes uranium, 233, and then it's... Um, ready to go. It says uranium-233, and we looked at its half-life a second ago. Like plutonium is produced from 238, it is physical, fizzle, meaning it will um, fly apart, it can be chemically separated from the thorium, and then uses a fuel. Uh, and like I, like I said in a couple of lectures ago, it says the use of thorium was explored in Shippingsport and in the USA, and I, I think it's starting to come back into fashion. That's um, kind of the next, you know, next potential fuel. Okay, so looking at the periodic table, um, anything more or less above iron, and this isn't. This is just. 
kind of rule of thumb. It's not exactly true. But any, anything above iron is more or less going to split or um, <clears throat> be a, you know, a fission reaction. Anything below iron is a fusion reaction. So you can think of a star beginning its life as primarily hydrogen, sort of climbs up to helium, all these nuclei coming together, becoming larger and larger, until it hits iron, and then the iron does not fuse anymore. It's, it's, it's done. It, it's sort of at the bottom of this energy well. Um, once a star has converted its fuel into iron, it, you know, it, it's, it's done. It's still, it's still collapsing, and rather than, um, and there's, there's no longer enough radiation pressure, if you will. So the, it, it, it's kind of weird to think about, but you, know, you start with this big gas ball. Gravity is shoving the nuclei together. There's nowhere for the protons to go but together. And then the heavier and heavier elements form. Once you hit iron, iron can't really be squished anymore. There, it, 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 and so the gravity is still pushing in. But the, and so the star is still collapsing, but the only thing left for it to do really as it's collapsing is explode. It just, it sort of, it, it, it bounces. It's like a, um, what's the right, you, know, you can think of a rubber ball bouncing against a solid wall, but the star itself sort of bounces against itself. You know, it sort of comes in in all directions, out in all directions. Once that final collapse happens, some of these uh, bigger, heavier nuclei are, in fact, formed through additional fusion, but only like right at the end of this star's life. So now you've got all these other elements, you know, much of, of higher energy levels, and you can just think of them as um, um, just dense pockets of a star that imploded millions of years ago, and, that, and that's what we got. So now they're sort of sitting at this higher, unstable energy level, Ready, or ready to decay back down into iron and what have you. So you can either go fusion up to iron or fission down to iron, just in, in general terms, of course. Okay. So why don't we do more fusion on planet Earth? Sakharov uh, talked a little bit about how to, how to do this. And in fact, the hydrogen bomb was you know partially his brainchild, so uh, he was able to you know more or less make a uh, a fusion reaction. And if we take a look, I know that the I know that the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs, which were fission bombs, were on the order of 68 terajoules. We might be able to see the energy released in some of the larger hydrogen bombs. Okay, here we go. Nineteen sixty one. Whoa, okay, so there we go. 210 petajoules in this hydrogen bomb. 1961, uh, that's what it looks like 100 miles away. So, uh, I mean, we're sitting here in um, Missoula, and that's what, like, Helena would look like, I think. Is that about, uh, about right? Not not good. Um, 210 petajoules. I mean, that's the um, annual energy budget for, you know, a, a country more or less going off in the matter of, of seconds. Um, but you can also imagine such a um, release of energy in a more controlled manner, and that's more or less what this technology is. So. The, um, the ions are 
uh, sped around in this uh, toroidal field. Um, I, I know we've talked a fair amount when we did our electricity chapter that the um, electric field and the magnetic field are always perpendicular to each other. And this is one way of looking at it. You've got this donut, this purple donut right here is perpendicular to all these little uh, purple circles encasing it. And um, there's just a cartoon of it. <coughs> Here's the inside of one such reactor itself in the UK. If I understand correctly, I've just heard in the popular press that um, the MIT fusion project was shut down, but I think there's uh, still one or two active in California. Um, so we haven't, we have not given up on this. There's a, um, you know, potential, because there's a, there's a lot of hydrogen, you know, there, there's, there's really, <laughs> you know, a lot of, a rep. Um, the, <clears throat> the problem here is you can see that this machine takes, you know, a heck of a lot of energy to run. It's a little bit like, you know, the starter motor in your car. Uh, you know, imagine for some reason if the starter motor in your car had to be really, really big and you would never get the, your engine running because your starter, anyway, it's kind of a, a similar analogy uh, where we don't, we don't um, the starter motor in these um, fusion reactors is still sort of bigger than what you uh, get back out of the, the actual engine itself. Okay, so there's one. Um, here's you know an example of a, of a smaller, more modular. Uh, so here's your generation three plus. Designed to operate with uranium up to five percent. Four parallel loops. Four steam generators. Yeah, and that's, that's about it for the chapter. Um, <coughs> you know, so one, one big theme here is that you know, we're, we're more than likely going to move away from the giant reactors to, to smaller, more distributed ones. You know, that's really kind of where energy's going anyway. You know, with, with distributed, you know, we're, we're talking about, uh, well, in fact, you know, we're going to put an 18 kilowatt solar panel array on the top of uh, Lomason. We, get, we applied for funding from the university and got that. Um, a couple energy technology students did that um, last year. We also applied for and got a little bit of funding to put a 50 kilowatt array on the roof of the West Campus and um, the facilities is enthusiastic about that. I don't, it's, it hasn't even reached Royce's radar. You know, it's like a one or two hundred thousand um, dollar deployment. I mean, just just for a fraction of what the study would cost for the three megawatt, we're going to be able to put in you know, the, the legal limit, basically. And in fact, I have a meeting tomorrow morning with a potential funder who's you know interested in, in seeing more renewable energy uh, come to Missoula. Uh, so, yeah, I think I think we're just kind of getting to, to that same to this point in energy technology in general where things are becoming more uh, just smaller, more distributed. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but I think it tends to put, uh, you know, make, make the process perhaps a little more democratic, you know. <coughs> All right, what else? Yeah, the summary just kind of hits hits the high points of what we just uh, what we just looked at. Okay, let's just take a little quick second and look at summary three.